ส้มอันเจยก็จบองจุนุจุบเรียกกะมันโตก็จำนาการในเตะพิธีนสัมนาคาเจกิปตนี่องค์มรสมดอลวิติกาจุนตือสาปริญญาดำไปันโตกาเพื่อในสนทานได้สังเขปสมจึง Excuse me, Mr. President, Your Honors. I have an application to make. We attempted to make it yesterday. I will make it again. I will try to make it today. It concerns my clients, and it concerns you, Mr. President, violating his human rights by forcing him to be here yesterday when he was unable to participate. He had a headache all afternoon. He took off the headset. He was unable to listen. He was in pain. He waived his presence. Yet you forced him to be here, claiming that this is an indispensable part of the proceedings. Opening statements are not evidence. Never have. Been, never will be. However, theatrical they may, uh, opening statements may be. So it is not an indispensable part of the proceedings. What is indispensable, I would say, are the rights of every accused, as well as the rights of all the other parties. Mr. Ing Sri wishes to participate, but he cannot do so if he cannot listen to the proceedings here in court. He wishes to participate downstairs. He is willing to do that, but, he, but to force him to be here, where he has to take off the headset, effectively turns this trial into a a sham trial, a show trial, and nothing more. His presence here becomes a mockery. He cannot participate, and he cannot advise his lawyers. Therefore, I would urge you, Mr. President, along with your colleagues, to deliberate on this issue and come to a resolution, because this is going to be a continuing problem. If you wish for the world to see that this is a model tribunal and that this is a court that is going to dispense justice as the prosecution yesterday suggested, invoking uh, Justice Jackson's uh, words, then I suggest that we do everything that we can to ensure that the proceedings go as smoothly as possible and that the accused can participate in their defense. In none, in none of the international tribunals or internationalized tribunals are accused forced to be in court. None. The International Criminal Court for the former Yugoslavia or for Rwanda or Sierra Leone or Lebanon or the ICC. We briefed the issue. We filed observations because we were concerned that some members of the, of the bench were not fully aware of or appreciated the fair trial rights of the accused, one of which is to waive his presence. That's why we did so. So we urge you, Mr. President, with the deepest respect, to please consider uh, or reconsider your decision. Allow Mr. King Shereen to go downstairs and watch the proceedings so later on he can advise his clients and give instructions to his clients. He is not withdrawing from the, from the uh, proceedings. He is participating. God he wishes to participate. Please allow him to participate by uh, ensuring that his fair trial rights are respected throughout the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Could I just make some brief observations on what Mr. Carnivas has said. Um, Young Siri's defence briefed the court on this issue. I think those observations were rejected. Our position, um, which we didn't file in the end because the Young Siri observations were not considered by the court, um, is that fundamentally, allow me to finish, Mr. Carnivas, allow me to finish. Uh, fundamentally, our position is that the accused should be present in court for the proceedings. That is the bottom line for the prosecution. However, however, if the court is minded, if the court is minded to allow 
Mr Yang Suri to follow the proceedings downstairs. And frankly, I find it extraordinary Mr Connolly is saying his client can't give him instructions in court. How on earth his client can give him instructions from downstairs defies belief. Nevertheless, if, if you are minded to allow Mr Yang Suri to follow the proceedings from downstairs, then we would require exactly what Mr Connolly has said himself, which is a written waiver, a written waiver signed by the accused. And the reason that we say that is because what we don't want is in appeal proceedings that the accused essentially says, well, actually, I wasn't present during the proceedings, um, so the trial proceedings were defective. So we would agree with Mr Carnivast that if the court were minded to allow Mr Yang Seri to follow the proceedings from downstairs, then he execute a written waiver in accordance with what Mr Carnivast has advised the court himself. Let me just correct the record, Mr President, because there are some half-truths here. First of all, our observations were not rejected. Second of all, the prosecution did indeed file something. Perhaps Mr. Kitty was not in the country at the time. But they did file something. And if you look at it very carefully, the position is slightly different than the one that he takes today. Second of all, when we filed our observations, those observations were filed on the basis of what, was, what happened during the initial hearing. Along with the observations, we filed a model waiver to be executed by, the, uh, by Ms. Singsuri or any accused who is not to be present. So this is not something novel. Secondly, I should say, now it appears that the prosecution is saying that if the accused is not present, he certainly cannot really participate downstairs after spending all of the millions of dollars of taxpayers' money to ensure that they can monitor the proceedings from down there. It is a ridiculous suggestion. Thirdly, even if Mr. Inksuri wanted to stay in his cell, he has a fundamental right to do so. That is, those are the international standards. We have always said that he would waive by, by signing a, uh, a waiver. We have never backed down from that. In fact, it was our suggestion. So for Mr. Katie to sit here today and make these demands, when in fact we've offered them already, to me, you know, it seems somewhat short and economical of the truth. We are prepared to participate. And the trial chamber tested those, uh, those cells down there so that the accused can monitor, and then we could go and get instructions. The accused are not going to be giving instructions moment to moment, even in the Hague or ICTY. The accused are far away from the, from the lawyers, and they don't have access to the clients in court. The instructions are going to be given during the breaks. After hours. But the client cannot give instructions if he cannot participate. Yesterday, he sat for an hour and a half, basically watching the prosecutor, listening, but not being able to hear or understand what exactly was being said, because he couldn't follow the proceedings. And what we're saying is, we have mechanisms, because of their advanced age, to cure that. We're not suggesting that you show sympathy, because the prosecutor yesterday, yesterday when he was saying, make sure not to show sympathy, uh, I, I understood him correctly. It wasn't uh, when it comes to these individuals as far as, far as assessing the facts. Uh, That's what he was warning me. Assess the facts as any court would do anywhere, anywhere in the world. In the world. Honestly, fairly. And that's what exactly we want you to do. But a, an accused is not participating if he's present, but his mind is not involved, is not engaged. That is a fact. And that's one of the reasons why one of the accused is not here today. Thank you. Thank you. ແລະមិនទៅហើយម្ដងពីលក្ខណៈនិយាយដល់ពេលនិយាយទៅវាទៅលោកកណ្ឌបាសនិយាយម្ដងទៀតអានេះតែឆ្លើយឆ្លងជ
จมในปีเปลี่ยนระเบียบนี้ได้อัดบานกาเกิดตัวรอบแค่อาจไปเยี่ยปีรอบแค่ได้สามมูลให้ในกิจนำนาการในเตปิธีนี้มันประกอบไปจีโดยเฉพาะปีเปกรอยเจอประชาชนบรรลุมีนบ่มน้องนงการในยี่คือลูกพี่ยิ้มเพื่อไม่ขัดคอมปรังไพรตัวปีธาปริญญาคือลูกมีนออกกะนงการเลือกประชาชนบ้านอองยิมได้อันยาตคือประเทศบ้านอาตรอันยาตอองยิมได้อันยาตดำไปเอาคัดมาทอยปีเวลีตกลาดเพียบเอาธาปริมีตวีกาปีขดายกีสรบแต่มาดองสมจึงบัดสมสมกรบลูกประเทศอิสาธาเขาเมีมองในขนมการเลือกยูบอลให้ลูกปตอปีเปลูกสหเปรียญกับบานเลือกได้กับแต่เพียมปตอปีลูกสหเปรียญบานจับประดามคือลูกการวัดบานเงือบโชนใบมียูบอลโดยเฉพาะขนมเมียนการขนมการบางฮันท่าเมียนเจตนาในขนมการเลือกขนมปียูบอลบอกครูนโดยเฉพาะขนมบัตรขนมนองท่าน้องยีเปลดอลตำนาการบอกตลาดกาตียังคนจังจุ่มเรียบมาปีจิตนาบอกดำบดังรอดไปนี่ติดคือท่าสำคัญนะเดี๋ยวท่าลูกเอี้ยงเสรีมีนวัตถุมีนเปรนี่โดยซาท่าอยากเป็นสามสัปชนะให้ได้ดำบดังรอดไปนี่กระโดดจนรงครัวรงจำไอเมียนสาวนาการในการลังให้ได้เมียนเนี่ยคลาดหลอดออกไปนี่กดเด็กยุ่มได้ทำเมียนสาวนาการในการลังให้ประสบบ่าวสำหรับปุกัดวัตถุมีนบอกลูกเอี้ยงเสรีนึกอะไรนี่ดำไปสนับในการเจ้าประกันการเลือกลาบอสหาเรียนนะคือเมียนตุ่มไรนะสำหรับบุกวัดได้ไปแจ้งท่าลูกเอี้ยงเสรีเมียนเจตนาในโครงการโจรวมในโครงการสร้างรถยนต์ทอพองได้โดยเฉพาะให้กับดาวบันเอิงรถวันนี้สารสมทากู้แต่ลูกเอี้ยงเสรีเมียนวัตถุมีนในตินี้ให้บังคับไปการคอมพลังบอกล้วนดำไปโจรวมในโครงการสนับการเลือกอันเป็นการเจ้าประกันโดยทุกทุกปีเปลี่ยนนี้มาสมกุล bạn sẽ đập tầm nào xong và chuẩn chụp chào đại thừa lang tam địa mỹ tv cà phê đây được bắt cọt đời xong mình chơi rôm sạm naka để toàn đồng một tốp sạm naka đi đời xong độ luôn thôi từ tam đàn cây chấm naka sạm naka pi chấm ngay nơi một tốp hàng cầu tam địa propon sau tu bạn sẽ đập tầm đây có tổng quan rồi bảo สาปีนี้บันทึกตามใจก็ตุ่มกอลหรือบ่มีตัวบีนอมกดมนางดาวมันดังรอบแบบนี้อ่องหยุมเรียโยลคืนท้าปัญหาดมนาการสามนาการในปีนี้คือจิตการทุกในสันทานสังเกตอภิการเจาะประกันไปช่างนึงจุดจับเจ้านึงดำไปบางไฮดอกเพียกีนึงสาชนะจุดดึงอ๋อไอ้บานดึงกันแต่เฉพาะท่าจุดจับเจ้าปฏิจิบันสัตดับนึงบานดึงนึงบัดเจาะประกันไปช่างนึงคลุนกอดให้ดูชนะอ่องหยุมเรียสมรัยปัตตาเซตในสมนาสมระบบชนจบเจ้าสมรัยอัจฉริยะเจ้าในขนมบนตุ๊บสัมนาการนี้ดำไปตามด้านสัมนาการชีพมันต่อสมชื่นสัพพิญญาอันตรจิตสำหรับ
move to an issue identified in your order of June of this year um, that you wished to be addressed in the opening statements, and that is the organizational structure of the Communist Party of Kampuchea and Democratic Kampuchea. If the next chart can be shown, um, the organizational chart that you see in front of you demonstrates that the leaders of the CPK exercised control through key, three key sets of entities. First of all, regional organizations. Second, military divisions that formed the RAK, and thirdly, government ministries, each of which reported up to the Standing Committee or Central Committee. Regionally, Democratic Kampuchea was divided into seven zones and two autonomous sectors, each of which reported directly to the Standing Committee. And as shown in this map from the DK period, the seven zones were the Northwest, the West, the Southwest, East, Northeast, Central and North zones, and the two autonomous sectors were Mondalkiri Province, known as Sector 105, and Crouchy Province, known as Sector 505. The central and north zones were originally one region, but in mid-1977, Priya Vahir and Siem Reap provinces, known as sectors 103 and 106, became the new north zone, north zone while Kampong Tom and the western half of Kampong Cham province became the central zone. Each zone was divided into a number of sectors and each sector into a number of districts. The districts were divided into communes or sub-districts and as shown in this chart, these entities formed a hierarchical organization through which information was reported from the bottom to the top and orders and policies were sent down from the top to the cadres on the ground. Each zone, sector, district and commune was overseen by a party committee consisting of a secretary, deputy and member. Two zone leaders, Southwest South Zone Secretary Tarmok and East Zone Secretary Sao Pim were on the CPK Standing Committee. And each zone or autonomous sector usually had at least two representatives on the Central Committee. As you will hear from the guards and drivers who worked for the party leaders at K1 and K3, the accused had regular meetings in Phnom Penh with zone and sector leaders and also travelled to the provinces for conferences with regional cadres. Every year, district leaders were required to come to Phnom Penh for a month of political education conducted by Nguyen Chia and Kyu Sampong. The evidence will show that the accused and other party leaders in Phnom Penh were fully informed on the implementation of CPK policy in the provinces, a compulsory system mandating regular reporting by the regions was put in place in early 1976. And that policy you will find set forth in the CPK statute. That statute required each echelon in the organizational hierarchy to report to the echelon above on its situation and the implementation of party plans. An 8 March 1976 Standing Committee meeting that proposed weekly reporting from the zones and sectors so that the Standing Committee knows the situation in order to provide timely instructions. And lastly, the policy on this is set forth in a 30th March 1976 decision of the Central Committee that established a regime of weekly reporting to Office 870. The Chamber will hear 
from telegram operators who work in zone or sector offices who will describe sending daily telegrams to the leaders in Phnom Penh and receiving responses in return. Witnesses from the Sector 105 office will testify that telegrams relating to enemy situations were to be sent to Nguyen Chia, and the former Sector Secretary has confirmed that the telegrams he sent were always responded to, usually by Pol Pot or Nguyen Chia. Your Honours will also hear from a cadre responsible for the office in Phnom Penh at which telegrams were received, translated from code and then sent to the party leaders at K1. He will explain how the distribution lists for these telegrams were added by the heads of that office pursuant to instructions received by the party leaders. This example before you reflects the standard distribution list, which included each member of the standing committee located in Phnom Penh. Pol Pot, usually simply referred to as Uncle, Nguyen Chia, usually listed as Uncle Nguyen, Yang Sari, referred to his alias Van, Son Sen, listed by his alias Q, and Von Vet, or Brother Vaughan. As part of their standard practice, copies of these telegrams were also routinely sent to office and documentation. The same witness will explain that the office copy was delivered to Q Sang Pan at Office 870, while the documentation or archive copy was kept and filed at the telegram office. Carbon paper was used to type multiple copies of each telegram, and telegrams were delivered to K1 two or three times a day. The reports received from zones followed a standard format. They would typically report first on the enemy situation, both external and internal. The external section would describe problems at the borders with Thailand and Vietnam and incidents of armed conflict. The internal enemy section would describe problems with cadres and new or base people, seek instructions from the party centre on measures to be taken, and report on arrests, interrogations and executions of enemies. A 15 June 1977 telegram from the Northeast Zone Secretary, copied to Nguyen Chia, Yang Sari and Q Sampan through Office 870, detailed how Division 801 had captured and detained 209 Yare soldiers from Vietnam and requested orders on what action to take after the, imprison, after the prisoners were interrogated. In the period following the telegram, a large group of Yare prisoners captured from Vietnam were executed at Okon Seng Security Center in Ratanakiri, pursuant to orders conveyed from the Northeast Zone Office, as you will hear from the prison chief, deputy and surviving prisoners. A 10 January 1978 telegram from North Zone Secretary Kang Chap, alias Sai, copied to Nguyen Chia, Yang Suri and Q Sampan through Office 870, states that enemies had infiltrated from the sector district to the commune and indicates that Sai planned to go to Sector 103 to search for enemies and send more crocodiles to the organization. Two months later, the same zone secretary reported that they had systematically purged enemies associated with former policemen, soldiers and government officials and new people and that they planned to arrest more people. The regular reports sent to Phnom Penh also included sections describing the status of agricultural production, the construction of dams and canals and the health of the local people, specifically informing the party leaders of the existence of food shortages and outbreaks of disease. This diagram in front of you demonstrates the reporting structures within the RAK. There were nine 
military divisions and a number of independent regiments that reported to the party leaders through the general staff office in Phnom Penh. The military forces under the control of the party centre included Naval Division 164 based in Kampong Song, Air Force Division 502, a number of divisions based in or around Phnom Penh responsible for defending and protecting the CPK leadership, and divisions based in Mondulkiri, 920 and Ratanakiri 801. Division leaders participated in regular meetings with General Staff Chairman Son Sen, a member of the Standing Committee, who lived with the accused at K3 and worked with them on a daily basis at K1. Minutes of those division meetings reveal how CPK policy was implemented in military organizations, particularly in regards to the identification and elimination or smash of enemies within the ranks. Military divisions were subject to the same reporting requirements as zones and submitted regular reports to Son Sen describing the enemy situation and status of agricultural production and work sites. Your Honours will hear testimony from the communications officer at the General Staff who has stated that the information received from the divisions was reported by Son Sen to other party leaders. You will also see a number of examples of division reports that contain handwritten notes from Son Sen forwarding reports to Ankar or Office 870. Government ministries also reported regularly and directly to the CPK leaders. As the various ministries were located in Phnom Penh, their reports were often made in person, either at standing committee meetings or at monthly meetings of the Council of Ministers attended by Pol Pot. Thus, Your Honours, the accused cannot credibly claim that they did not know and had no control over the crimes that occurred throughout democratic Kampuchea between April 1975 and January 1979. Quite to the contrary, the control exercised by CPK leaders over all aspects of Cambodian society was frightening, pervasive, and complete. Your Honours can see this knowledge and control simply by reading the detailed reports and telegrams that were regularly sent to the party leaders in Phnom Penh. If a villager in Ratanakiri had an affair, his moral offence would be included in the weekly reports sent to the party leaders. The accused were informed of everything, from the number of couples married each month, to how much it rained, to the identity of persons who complained about the party's cooperative program and lack of food. If the accused wanted an orange from Persat, it would be picked and delivered to them. But if a parent sought to pick some fruit or catch a fish for a starving child, they would be arrested, reported to Ankar, and sent for re-education. Death might come swiftly, but not swiftly enough to spare the torture. In democratic Kampuchea, every act of disobedience was viewed as a threat and treated as enemy subversion to be reported to the organization and dealt with by appropriate measures. Your Honours, as I've emphasized throughout my opening remarks, the crimes that occurred during the democratic Kampuchea regime were not random events attributable to rogue cadres. They also cannot be blamed solely on Pol Pot, as some of the accused may try in this trial. These crimes were the result of organized plans developed by the accused and other CPK leaders and systematically implemented through the regional, military and government bodies they controlled. The sad truth is, that it took hundreds, even thousands, of willing participants fully in agreement with the CPK agenda to run a regime that lasted over three years, enslaved an entire nation, and killed over a million people. Such atrocities, Your Honours, cannot possibly be the responsibility of one man acting alone.
Rather, in this trial, the co-prosecutors will prove beyond reasonable doubt that the crimes for which the accused have been indicted were committed pursuant to a common criminal plan or joint criminal enterprise in which Nguyen Chia, Yang Siri, and Q Sampon were knowing and willful participants. And now I will address each one of those criminal policies within the joint criminal enterprise, starting first with the forcible movement of the population from cities and rural areas. Millions of people were forced to abandon their homes in Phnom Penh and other towns and cities throughout the country. Their schools, temples and markets were closed. Whatever you were on the 16th of April, whether a teacher or a student, a lawyer or a doctor or a monk or a policeman or the owner of a family business, on the 17th of April, your life now belongs to the Communist Party of Kampuchea. What happened in Phnom Penh and other cities on the 17th of April 1975 it was not a novel or new policy of the CPK, nor was it a response to immediate events or circumstances. Rather, it was a carefully planned policy that had been developed and implemented by the accused and other CPK leaders for years in the previous territories they occupied and controlled. It was in 1971 during the Chen II battle that the CPK pioneered a tactic they called seizing the people. This involved capturing and evacuating the population of entire cities, then killing anyone amongst the population deemed to be a class enemy. This tactic was implemented in Krauche, in Banam, in Kampong Cham during 1973. In Kampong Cham, the CPK evacuated 15,000 people after temporarily overrunning the city and then killed 10,000 enemies. The same tactic was ex executed by the accused in Udon in 1974. This is Philip Short's description of events that followed the capture of the town of Udon in late March 1974, and I quote, the population of the town, some 20,000 people, was rounded up and marched to the forests of Palau before being resettled in cooperatives in the special zone and southwest. Officials and uniformed soldiers were separated from the rest, led away and killed, end quote. As Commander-in-Chief of the National Liberation Armed Forces, Q Sampan was one of the CPK leaders actively directing his strategy. In a speech given in North Korea in April 1974, also attended by Yang Suri and Yang Tirik, he bragged how one month earlier Khmer Rouge troops had annihilated Udong, eliminating 5,000 enemies. About two weeks before the fall of Phnom Penh in 1975, a meeting was held at Pol Pot's headquarters near Udong to give the final orders to the military relating to the evacuation of Cambodia's cities. A guard present at that meeting, who later became the security chairman of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, will testify that both Nguyen Chia and Q Sampon attended that meeting and agreed with the plan to evacuate Cambodia's cities. Q Sampon admits that he was at this location with the other CPK leaders during this period. Yang Suri was in Beijing when the final orders were given to the military, but was part of the CPK leadership that developed the evacuation strategy during the 1970s. In particular, Yang Suri attended the party's Central Committee meeting in June 1974 that planned the liberation of Phnom Penh and admits having discussed the evacuation plan with Pol Pot. 
the purpose of the evacuations of Phnom Penh and other Cambodian cities in 1973, 1974 and 1975 was not to protect the people. It was not a reaction to food supply problems. It was not, as was announced, to the residents of Phnom Penh when they were ordered to leave the city on 17 April 1975 to move civilians from areas that face threats to bombing by the US military. None of this. The evacuations were a strategy derived from the CPK leaders' belief that urban areas were the nerve center of the party's class enemies. It was designed to remove those enemies from their base so that they could be identified, separated and killed. The criminal intent or purpose behind the evacuations is reflected in a number of statements made by the accused and other party leaders. In a January 1977 speech, the CPK cadres knew and cheer described the 1973 and 1974 evacuations as a very important strategic line of the party that cut off the heads and the tail of the enemy by controlling and seizing the people. In July 1978, Nguyen Chia described how in the pre-liberation period there were few enemies in rural areas but many enemies in the cities and that the evacuation of the cities was done in order to move to the countryside and smash enemy agents. Q. Sampan has acknowledged that the evacuation of Phnom Penh was the result of a collective decision in which he participated and defended that decision quoting the party line that the countryside is an important foundation for the revolution. Whilst the city is the apparatus of the power holding classes and the imperialists, the location where the enemies of the revolution may assemble their forces to smash us. Revolutionary Flag, the publication of the CPK leadership, distributed only to party members, described the evacuation of the cities as class struggle. And during a press conference in Beijing on 3 October 1977, with Ying Seri standing by his side, Pol Pot admitted that the evacuation of city residents to the countryside was done in order to scatter the enemy into cooperatives where they could be crushed. You have heard yesterday from Madam Chia Liang about the horrific crimes that took place on 17 April 1975 and the ensuing days as the city of Phnom Penh was cleared out, millions of people forced to abandon not only their homes and belongings but their entire lives, their job or their business, their place of worship and in many cases their families and loved ones. The crime sites for which the accused had been indicted also include Tolpol Tre, a killing site in Pasat province, where thousands of soldiers and officials from the Lon Nol government were gathered and executed over a one-week period, and a district in Kampong Chang that was a long-time base of the CPK, where evacuees who arrived from Phnom Penh and other locations... Thank you, Mr. President. Let me just repeat if that was lost. The crime sites for which the accused have been indicted also include Tolpol Tre, a killing site in Persa province where thousands of soldiers and officials from the Long Nol government were gathered and executed over a one-week period, and a district in Kampong Chiang that was a long-time base of the CPK where evacuees who arrived from Phnom Penh and other locations were screened and persons who were identified 
as London soldiers or officials, landowners, business owners or other class enemies were taken away and executed. The accused directly decided and ordered the mass killings of officials and soldiers from the Lon Nol government. A resolution of the Second National Fund Congress signed by Q Sam Pan in late February 1975 expressly called for the execution of seven leaders of the Lon Nol regime who the Khmer Rouge called the super traitors. Two of those seven individuals, Prime Minister Long Bore and Prince Siri Mata, chose not to flee the country as Khmer Rouge forces approached and took over Phnom Penh. Long Bore surrendered himself to the CPK on 17 April 1975. Siri Matak sought refuge at the French Embassy in Phnom Penh. But with CPK forces surrounding and threatening to attack the embassy, he and hundreds of other Khmer nationals were forced to leave the embassy grounds on 20 April 1975 and he was taken into custody by CPK military leaders. The execution of Siri Matak and Long Baret were officially announced to the world by Yang Siri at a press conference in Bangkok in early November 1975. These crimes committed by the CPK at the very outset of their regime were just the beginning. I'll now turn to the second policy that was part of the joint criminal enterprise which the accused have been charged, which is the establishment of cooperatives and work sites at which the Cambodian population was enslaved. Once the inhabitants of cities had been evacuated, those who survived were moved into rural cooperatives and forced to work under gruelling conditions with starvation rations. As was the case with forced movements, the establishment of cooperatives was a CPK policy that was initially developed by the leaders of the party prior to April 75. In May 1972, the CPK Central Committee approved plans for the collectivization of agriculture. Cooperatives were officially imposed in the regions controlled by the Khmer Rouge one year later on 20 May 1973, a day commemorated by the CPK as the birth of the peasant cooperative organization. The collectivization of Cambodian society meant the elimination of markets, currency and private property and the dismantling of the existing means of agricultural production. Peasants who had been low-paid workers for feudalist landowners became unpaid slaves working for the CPK leaders. When implemented throughout the entire country, after the CPK took power on 17 April 1975, all of Cambodia would become a prison without walls. As proclaimed by Yang Siri in early 1976, the entire country was now a vast work site. The accused and other party leaders provided instructions to Cadre on how to organize cooperatives both through written publications such as Revolutionary Flag and political education and training conducted by the leaders in person. The chamber 
will hear testimony from a former commune secretary from Krachi describing a speech given by Nguyen Chia to sector, district and commune cadres in 1973 or 1974 explaining how to set up cooperatives. The implementation of agricultural cooperatives was not optional. You were not free to opt out of party cooperatives and grow your own fruit and vegetables. You were not even free to criticize the party's policy. This was made very clear in a speech given by Nguyen Chia at the annual West Zone Conference in July 1977 and published the following month in Revolutionary Flag. In that speech, Nguyen Chia described how one West Zone cadre later discovered to be an enemy embedded inside our party had criticized collectivization in his presence at the prior zone conference, claiming that private property cattle are fatter than collective property cattle. That cadre was Upun, alias Ham, the Deputy Secretary of Sector 32 of the West Zone. Earlier, in 1977, he had been arrested, taken to S21, and interrogated for months until he signed multiple lengthy confessions. He served as a clear example of the consequences for those who questioned the party's policies. Your Honours, the co-prosecutors will prove that all aspects of the cooperative programme were determined by the CPK leaders on the Standing and Central Committees, from the quotas establishing the amount of rice to be produced, to the rations that each person was allowed to consume, to the number of people allocated to work in each region. In August 1975, the Standing Committee visited the Northwest Zone and concluded that the zone required an additional 400,000 to 500,000 workers in order to fully exploit the fertile farmland in that region. By the following month, the party leaders had decided to forcibly transfer an additional half million people from other zones to the northwest, which decision was communicated in a party circular dated 19 September 1975. This decision was made despite the CPK leaders knowing, as reflected in their own documents, that the previous evacuees or new people who had been sent to the northwest zone from Phnom Penh and other cities earlier that year lacked both food and medicine. For the evacuees who survived the second forced transfer of the DK regime, a worse fate awaited them. Half a million Cambodians were moved to a region that did not have the necessary food and shelter to support them. Over the next two years, tens of thousands of people would die from starvation in the northwest zone. As reported by Sector 5 of the Northwest Zone, in one district alone, in 1976, 20,000 people died of starvation. It was the accused and other party leaders who determined both the amount of rice rationed for each person to eat and the amount of rice that was expected to be produced. These issues were discussed by the leaders at party conferences on economic issues and their decisions incorporated into planning documents and communicated to cadres throughout the country.
tam với anh sáp hèn cá từ cam áp bà thân ác rong đầm bì at the first nationwide party economic conference held in November 1975, the party centre approved a three tonnes per hectare quota for rice harvesting in 1976, which was published and communicated to Padre Cartes in that month's issue of Revolutionary Flag. Three tonnes per hectare became a slogan that was endlessly repeated by CPK leaders in meetings, in speeches and in publications like Revolutionary Flag and stressed as essential to both national defence and the ongoing class struggle. The fact that in many places the soils of Cambodia were not rich enough to yield three tonnes was irrelevant. The fact that the rains may have failed to come in some places was irrelevant. The fact that there may have been rats or insects or plant disease or not enough seed was totally irrelevant. The fact that the people may have been too exhausted from overwork too weak from lack of food, too sick from disease to work in the fields was irrelevant. The fact that the new people had absolutely no idea how to cultivate rice was irrelevant. If you did not achieve the three times policy, you risked being accused of failure or treason and branded an enemy of the party. As part of this same policy of the establishment of cooperatives and work sites, the accused also decreed that massive waterworks projects were to be built across the nation. In May 1975, Nguyen Chia informed party cadres of the decision to build irrigation dams and canals throughout the country starting in 1976. The four-year plan of the party prepared in 1976 called for a network of dikes and canals and the second nationwide economic conference in November 1976 emphasized the need to increase water supply by being two to three times stronger in comparison to 1976 and building more dams, canals and reservoirs. Two of the party's biggest irrigation projects were the 1st January Dam in Kampong Tom province and the Trao Pang Thma Dam in Bante Menchi. These were massive work sites at which tens of thousands of workers were assigned. The first January dam was so large that it can be seen from outer space, as shown by this satellite photograph from Google Earth. While the size of these projects was enormous, the time periods established by the party leaders for their completion were irrationally short. For example, the chairman of the first January Dam work site was told that the party leadership was expected to complete the 60 kilometre long dam in no more than one year. The unrealistic directives set by the CPK leaders as part of their great leap forward resulted in the workers at these sites having to work night and day under the worst conditions imaginable. They were often expected to work from 5 in the morning until 10 at night. The food that they were provided was insufficient. The medical care 
substandard and many workers became sick and died of overwork, starvation or disease. The construction of these massive dams was done primarily by hand, as you can see in this CPK propaganda film. The accused were, <coughs> the accused were well aware of the inhumane conditions at these work sites to which they were subjecting the Cambodian people. In 1976, the Standing Committee determined to spend as much as one half of their time inspecting the bases and overseeing the implementation of their production policies. The accused thus frequently travelled to the provinces to inspect the dams and other major work sites, as you will hear from both their drivers and the workers located at those sites. One of those drivers has described taking Nguyen Chia, Yang Seri and Khu Sampon to visit such sites, noting the hardship of the people and destitute conditions were readily apparent and could easily be observed by the accused. That same driver states that he went to all of the provinces and that Nguyen Chia went down to see the dam sites very often about five to six times per month, during which trips he would meet with local cadres to discuss increase of the production and dam buildings. Some of the visits by the accused were reported in DK state radio broadcasts that were monitored transcribed uh, and published in the Foreign Broadcast Information Service or BBC Summary of World Broadcasts, such as Yang Seri's March 1976 tour of work sites in Siem Reap province at which 20 to 25,000 people worked. Witnesses recall Yang Seri, Kyu Sampon, and Nguyen Chia visiting the 1st January Dam. And the following film clip shows one of Nguyen Chia's visits during the inauguration ceremony for that dam. The accused also visited Trang Pang Thma Dam and Kampong Cham Airport construction site, a work site that was established in 1976 standing committee meetings attended by Nguyen Chia, Yang Seri and Kyu Sampan and used for punishment by Yang Seri for Ministry of Foreign Affairs workers who committed minor wrongdoing, such as being sick too much or not working hard enough. In addition to their visits in person, the accused also received regular reports from the zones on the status and conditions of these projects. At an 8 March 1976 meeting of the Standing Committee, attended by Nguyen Chia and Kyu Sampan, the, sec the Secretary of the Siem Reap Sector 106 reported that many people were sick and that there had been outbreaks of cholera and chickenpox, resulting in a loss of 40% of the labour force. On 2nd April 1976, Central Zone Secretary Kai Pol reported that people were vigorously on the offensive, building the new rice field dike system according to the goals set by Ankar, Though there was widespread fever and diarrhea due to people working and overheating. You will hear statements made by the accused themselves which reflect their knowledge of the conditions that prevailed at work sites and cooperatives in democratic Cambodia. Despite their knowledge 
of the suffering of the Cambodian people, the, the accused continued to push the rapid construction of more dams and canals, and in 1978 increased rice production quotas to the 3.5 tons per hectare and directed that two crop land be doubled. Even worse, knowing that people were dying from starvation in many areas, the accused directed that large amounts of rice and other foodstuffs be taken from the people's cooperatives and used for export. In the cruelest of ironies. The leaders of the CPK found that although they had rid the country of capitalism and capitalists, they still needed capital. And because they had abolished currency, the only thing they could use to pay for capital was rice and other foodstuffs. And so, in their four-year plan, they calculated for every 100,000 tons of rice they exported, they could get $20 million in cash. And based on their capital needs, they determined how much rice they needed from each region. Each year, pursuant to this plan, rice was taken out of the hands of starving workers and peasants and used by the party leaders to buy machines, gasoline and other supplies. This your honours, was the final legacy of the CPK's collectivisation policy. Lives of exploited workers, human beings, traded for capital. I'll now move to the third policy of the Joint Criminal Enterprise, the re-education of so-called bad elements and killing of enemies. Of all the crimes committed by the CPK, none will be remembered and mourned more so in this country than the unlawful arrest, detention, torture and execution of hundreds of thousands of Cambodians at a nationwide network of security or re-education offices. Earlier Today, I submitted how Nguyen Chia, Yang Seri, and the other founders of the CPK adopted a policy or party line in September 1960 to use armed violence to defeat the feudalists, capitalists, and reactionaries they considered their enemies. This political line was fundamental to the accused's agenda and something to which all individuals who joined the CPK had to confirm their agreement. As Q. Sampon has written, all members were required to resubmit their applications to join the party following the adoption of these new party lines in 1960. The CPK leaders believed that they had discovered the secret to waging a communist revolution, a secret that had eluded the grasp of their communist forebears. The accused believed that previous communist revolutions had failed because class enemies had infiltrated and corrupted those revolutions. The solution the accused seized upon was simply to liquidate all class enemies in their entirety. And while 
the decision to use violence against political enemies may have started in the 1960s as a means to win power in a civil insurgency. That policy continued after the accused came into power in April 1975 at which time it became a means to protect the power now held by CPK leaders against all Cambodians who actually or potentially opposed, disagreed or failed to comply with their political agenda. To this day, Nguyen Chia insists that the people they murdered during the DK regime were all enemies or traitors. ແລະໂດຍຕາຈັ່ງມັນເລື່ອງທໍາມະດາແລະມັນເລື່ອງບັດບັດບັງຕຶກໃດມາຈັ່ງອ້າມປີຈັ່ງອ້າມມັນນະ
to be killed by the CPK grew to include the soldiers and officials of the prior regimes whom the Khmer Rouge had fought, both the Lon Nol or Khmer Republic government and the Sankham Reap Nien. Also suspect were the residents of Phnom Penh and other cities who'd been evacuated to the countryside when the CPK took power, persons who became referred to as 17 April or New People. And as the DK regime progressed and the paranoid leaders of the CPK convinced themselves that their failures must be due to the CIA, KGB or Vietnamese agents, the focus of their enemy witch hunt shifted from class enemies to internal enemies who had infiltrated the ranks of the party. These purges started with the arrest of a few soldiers following a grenade explosion at the Royal Palace, but quickly spread to the commanders of their divisions and eventually to the cadres in all zones, ministries and military divisions throughout the country implicated in confessions obtained at the Standing Committee's security office, which you now know as S21. In the final year of the regime, with the escalation of the armed conflicts between Vietnam and Democratic Kampuchea, it was the Vietnamese who became the number one enemy focused on by CPK leaders. This wave of killings extended to anyone with a connection to or relation in Vietnam, including the residents of the East So, who were guilty of living too close to the Vietnam border, and the Khmer Krom community, ethnic Khmer's whose ancestors had lived in Vietnamese territory. Such persons were accused of having a Khmer body with a Vietnamese head. The CPK leadership also determined that the Cham people were enemies of the state and carried out mass executions of the remaining Cham population in their historic base along the Mekong River in Kampong Cham province. And it was not just the persons who fell into one of these targeted groups whom the party leaders declared to be traitors or enemies, but also anyone related or connected to them. Pull out the grass by the roots was the CPK slogan. Guilt in the Khmer Rouge worldview was somehow genetic. So they did not merely kill enemies. They often exterminated the entire family of anyone defined as the enemy. Wives, children, and in many cases, parents and siblings. All either arrested or considered suspect and closely monitored for signs of enemy activity. The party lines regarding enemies established by the accused and other CPK leaders were communicated to party cadre by a number of means. Regular political education or training of cadre was conducted by Nguyen Chia, Khieu Sam Pan and Yang Sari at locations in Phnom Penh such as this, Bori Kela or the Olympic Stadium which would be attended by cadres from districts, sectors, zones and military divisions across the country. This shows, this fo that photo that you've just sh shown, shows one of the conferences led by Kyu Sampan, Yang Sari, Son Sen and Hu Nin. And this video that you're about to see shows Pol Pot and Nguyen Chia leading a mass meeting of cadres.
Yang Sari also provided political education at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Bong Trabe re-education site, used for returning intellectuals or students and former diplomats, as you will hear from a number of witnesses from those sites. A document from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs records one example of such instruction. At a 10 July 1976 Ministry Congress, cadres were told that 1 to 5 per cent of the country were traitors, boring from within and instructed to investigate biographies, carry out self-criticism, monitor all activities of personnel and handle pests buried deep inside so that spies cannot infiltrate into our ministry. The other principal means by which party lines were transmitted to cadre was through circulars from Office 870 and the monthly party journal Revolutionary Flag, which was distributed throughout the country and required reading for all party members. In those publications, one consistent message was repeated again and again, month after month. That message was the necessity to identify and smash enemies of the party. Your Honours, the second annex of the co-prosecutor's trial document list identifies 86 such publications, circulars and directives that were issued by the CPK leadership to their cadres, primarily between April 1975 and January 1979. In those 86 CPK publications, the word enemy, enemies or traitor appear at least 4,707 times, on average twice every page. The consequences of these incessant instructions to cleanse the country of enemies was the arrest detention, interrogation, torture, and execution of hundreds of thousands of Cambodians at S21 and the 200 other security officers spread throughout this country. This can be directly seen in the telegrams or reports sent from the zones to the party centre from which it's clear beyond any doubt that it was the accused enemy policy that was responsible for the widespread arrests and executions that plagued democratic Kampuchea that my fellow co-prosecutor described to you yesterday. In addition to their roles, forming the CPK enemy policy, as members of the Standing and Central Committee, each of the accused also directly participated in the implementation of this plan, both collectively, as a group, and as individuals. Collectively, Nguyen Chia, Yang Seri and Kyu Sam Pon participated in decisions on arrests at the Standing Committee meetings they attended. For example, at a meeting held on 8 March 1976, the Deputy Secretary of the North Zone reported on enemy activities and the arrests of various persons in his region and requested instructions on what to do with a group of people who had attempted to flee to Vietnam. In response, the Standing Committee 
instructed that those persons were to be detained and interrogated and the results reported to upper echelon along with a case file. A key witness in these proceedings regarding the role of the Standing Committee, an individual accused in the arrests of high-level cadre, will be S21 Chairman Comrade Doig. One such cadre, whose fate was decided by the accused, was Central Committee Member Sunao alias Chuk the Secretary of Sector 24 of the East Zone. Chuk had been implicated as an enemy by Division 170 Secretary Chan Chakri and other cadres arrested and interrogated at S21 in mid-1976. Doik will describe how he was requested to provide seven copies of the confession excerpts implicating Chuk, one for each member of the Standing Committee. He will also testify how the committee decided to arrest Chuk in August 1976. Nguyen Chia personally went to the K7 messenger office on the riverside to observe Chuk's arrest. Another high-ranking cadre under the suspicion at this time was Khoi Tung, alias Tuch, a long-time member of the Central Committee who had originally served as Secretary of the North Zone and later as the Minister of Commerce. Here you see a photograph of Khoi Thun at S21. After his arrest was ordered by the Standing Committee in April 1976, Khoi Thun was held in a house on the grounds of K1 for over nine months, a site visited by each of the accused on an almost daily basis. You will hear testimony from one of the guards who worked at K1 and delivered food to Khoi Thun at that house. The facts regarding Khoi Thun's arrest have also been confirmed by Q Sam Park in one of his books. Khoi Thun was transferred from K1 to S21 on 25 January 1977, where he was personally interrogated by Doik. Later, he was subjected to severe torture on orders provided by Standing Committee member Son Sen. The confessions of Khoi Thun and Chuk, which shake the party to its core. Each implicated a vast network of traitors in an anti-party conspiracy that included leading cadres from zones, military divisions and ministries across all of democratic Kampuchea. The internal purges that ensued spread across the entire apparatus of the CPK and would result in the arrest and execution of tens of thousands of party cadre as reflected in the chart you are about to see. Minister of Propaganda, Hu Nim, was number 13 on Khoi Thun's list of reported traitors. On 10 April 1977, 
He was arrested and taken to S21. Hunim's immediate response was to write a letter to the people responsible for his arrest, denying any betrayal of the party. As a government minister, and part of the leadership located in Phnom Penh, Hu Nim certainly understood who the party leaders were who controlled and would decide his fate. So it is very telling indeed, Your Honours, that his plea of innocence was addressed to Pol Pot, Nguyen Chia, Yang Sari, Von Vet, Son San and Kyu Sampong. Moreover, as members of the CPK Central Committee, Nguyen Chia, Yang Sari, and Kyu Sampan authorized killings inside and outside the ranks of the CPK in a 30 March 1976 decision. In this decision, the accused provided authority to the zone committees to conduct executions in the bases. The Central Office Committee, a reference to Office 870, was authorized to smash surrounding the center office. Executions in independent or autonomous sectors were to be decided by the Standing Committee and the General Staff, the center military headquarters led by Son Sen, was given authority to smash within the party centre military. The decision of the accused to provide broad authority to CPK leaders to carry out the party policy on enemies resulted in countless deaths and is clear evidence in my submission of their intent to kill. In addition, to their collective actions and intent as members of the Standing and Central Committees, the co-prosecutors will also prove, beyond a reasonable doubt, the individual participation, knowledge and intent of each of the accused. I'll briefly set out the specific roles of each of the accused in relation to the arrest, detention and execution of perceived enemies. I don't know whether you wish to take a break at this point, Mr. President, I'm being indicated that it may be appropriate. I can continue if you wish. ចាប់ពីពីនេះទៅទៅលោកដល់ម៉ោងដល់ 1 ខ្វះ